Okay, so this is the setup video for the other videos that I just did on Linux Mint. Um, I just recorded 20 minutes of footage and the app I was using just decided not to record it. Just got a blank screen. So I'm going to try again and unfortunately you're not going to get the benefit of me doing it for real and picking up the little things on the way. So I'll try my best to remember. So the first thing you should do is uh, set your um, much like I did in the easy install video, you just do that again, just set your display, uh, click on, you know, set primary, apply, uh, then drag the other monitor around, apply, uh, except this time it should, it should stick. Um, actually there's, then you get glitches with the default video driver that comes with uh, Linux Mint, I found, and it wouldn't quite remember the, um, what I'd done. Um, so yeah, this, this startup screen you get, it's got a lot of useful starting points on it, drivers. Um, you saw me click on it there and just type my password. You, the start menu has everything in anyway. You click the start menu, you can type drivers and get get here as well. Um, when you do this the first time, it's got those on by default. So you just choose the proprietary ones and you click apply changes and then it will take a little while and update the drivers and then ask you to restart. And then you shouldn't get any more glitches with your display so that's really good. What's next? Um, let me just look at my notes here. You definitely want to, so I'm going to hit the start, you can't see it, you hit the start menu just like in Windows, type screen saver, choose the first one that comes up and you definitely want to uncheck these, they're checked by default, I mean definitely this one. You don't want to have to type your password every time you wake up the computer and I also like to just not activate the sc screen saver when the computer's idle because the screen goes dark and I don't like to like to wake it up and I like to look at it across from across the room if I'm doing something. So yeah, definitely uncheck those. Close um, the system clock. Uh, it does some funky things with your time. Like it'll actually I don't know why it's it's not quite right. Maybe it's because your um, location isn't set. But if you just and, and it, it, to the point where you quit Linux and you deal boot, you switch boot back into Windows and your clock's wrong. So to prevent that and just have it be normal, uh, open the terminal. That's the little dark icon on the bottom left of the taskbar. You can't see it unless just click that. There's also a shortcut that works in most Linux desktops. I don't know what it is. We just open a terminal and you type this time, date, settle, set local rtc1 set local real time clock one um i've already set that but uh your time actually should set fix itself the moment you do that um that means use the local real time clock um but you can just right click on the clock just like you do in windows uh click uh, preferences and you can climb settings will let you change the time here it has to be in 24 hour time but then you can choose 12 hour format here. Uh, you can add your location. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, change the boot timeout. Now, the boot timeout is 10 seconds by default and I wanted to change it to five seconds. Um, again, with the uh, terminal, uh, you wanna type um, sudo is like a special command that precedes any command you might type, but it's like gives you admin privileges, is the way I understand it. So, sudo means admin, and then gedit is a program that edits text files. Uh, and we're going to edit the text file etc default grub because grub is the bootloader. It's like the uh, global universal bootloader or something, uh, but that's the file it uses to start up. Uh, the first time you type gedit, it'll want you to install it, so just type what it says to type. It's like sudo get gedit or something. It'll set, tell you, and press enter, it'll install it. Uh, just go past the prompt, say yes, and then try that command again. You just have to press up to get it back, and press enter. And then it'll ask for your password, it's the same password you're entering for all little things. When you type, it doesn't respond at all, there's no characters, just type it and press enter. And that'll work. Um, the reason gedit's not installed, I guess, is because Linux Mint comes with its own one called TextEdit, but 
you know, a lot of the tutorials you'll see will get you to use gedit. Anyway, it's this file. If you didn't use the word sudo, it would be in read only. So I use the word sudo, so now I can edit and save the file. And uh, timeout is set to 10 by default. You can set it to 5, you can hit save. And then to make it permanent, you type um, sudo update grub to. I think you can just type grub. You see a lot of tutorials saying update grub and you can do that. I don't think the two matters anymore. It used to be they updated to grub two, but now update will you can type update grub and it will do the same thing. Um, press enter and you'll get another password prompt. Again, password, uh, just follow the prompts and you'll want to reset the computer. And then when you do, the timeout will be different. Uh, what else? Sorry if I'm slurring my speech, I'm a bit tired. It's been a long day of doing this. Um, recording videos. Yes, how to get your Windows partitions to show up. You'll find if you open the file manager, um, it's down the bottom left where you can click the home icon up the top there. Uh, you can click on these drives here, just like in the Mac, and they'll just mount automatically, and you'll think, oh, I don't need to do anything else. Well, they'll mount, and you can get your Windows files and all your data there, but the next time you open a program, like next time you reboot, those are not available anymore until you click them here. It's like an auto-mount feature, which means if you've been running programs that you've told to look for files in certain places, or open recent file, uh, it won't be available anymore, and it'll be really frustrating. So, here's how you uh, make sure that your Windows drives are mounted here the way you want them to be. Uh, you don't mount drive letters like you do in Windows, everything's a folder. So you're going to mount it to a folder location for each of your drives. So you hit the Start menu button and you type uh, Disks, I think. There it is, can you see that? Yeah, you can. Disks, oh, not really well. Anyway, Disks, search for Disks, run that, you get this. And all your installed hard drives show up and you click on one and you can see the partitions on each one. Um, let's pick one that hasn't been done yet. Uh, so, wait a minute, what have I got? Uh, oh, that's my Linux stuff, I don't want to mount that. Um, so, my 3 terabyte big drive with all the games and stuff on it. Uh, I can mount that, I'll click the cog icon. Play will mount it temporarily, we don't want that, we want to adjust the permanent settings. So click the cog icon, click edit mount options. Auto mount is on. Auto mount is the feature that when you're browsing it in the file explorer like I showed you, it means when you click on it, it mounts at that moment. We don't want to do that. We want it to mount on startup. Notice these grayed out boxes, they're ticked. It says mount on startup. That's a lie. If it's grayed out, you can't trust it. So you turn off auto mount and you make sure that these are set the way you want. The default settings are fine. Mount a startup, show a user interface, great. The only thing you want to change is what folder it mounts as. Um, now, it's, it's, it chooses, so you literally you could put any path that you wanted, but I'm going to leave it at under mount, MNT, but we don't want this weird, long, weird name it's given based on the drive ID. So we'll have mount, uh, what's in here? Uh, I got all my user data in there, so I'll call it, um, um, user might be confusing. Um, Ah, user, whatever. Um, I'll just call it user for now. And that means that's the path that I'll be browsing when I open a program. I'll go to the top level, mount, user. I'll have all my files, in because like, i got my user folder from Windows in there. That's why I want to call it user, but you know, I could call it games or something. Um, but that will be permanent once I click the OK button. And we get the password prompt, put your little password in, and now that's going to stick. So when I restart, that path will be available, and when I open the program again the next day, it'll still find the files there. Uh, so that's how you mount your drives and show, um, yeah, we, so you can get your files from in the Linux system. Um, uh, and menu shortcuts. Um, so it's super easy to do. Um, 
right click the menu um, well no 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 I shouldn't be telling you that yet so that's a bit confusing let's get some programs first let's get some programs easiest way software manager if it's in here you'll, you'll laugh and it's great it's easy and a lot of the things you will find in there now with Linux apps um, be open-minded and try the Linux alternative to the one you're used to using and see how you go. Um, you might be surprised or you might be disappointed. Um, but there's, there's always a solution, so we'll get to that. But anyway, there's a lot of things in here. Um, all the mainstream stuff you could probably want are in there. Uh, you can search, so I've clicked this helpful window here, but see how it's called the software manager? So to open it up, hit the start menu, search for software manager and click. And you've got the software manager. So as you can see, all the mainstream things you might want, these shuffle around all the time, but you just search for what you want. Like if I type Dropbox, you know, there's Dropbox. Um, I'm, I've been continually surprised. Check in here, check the software manager. The odds are what you're going to want is in here already. Um, and it's super easy. Click it, install it. It's just like having a phone app thing. Um, you open this again to remove programs you click here you click show installed applications i haven't done anything yet yeah and from there you can click on it and then click remove it's just like the app store once you open the page for the app if you've installed it it says remove if you haven't installed it it says install so oh, and launch so yeah super cool um i know windows 10 has a thing like that i don't know how successful that's going these days i don't have windows 10 my computer doesn't run it but this has been going for years and it's amazing if it's not in here, you can go the whole old fashioned, um, the same old way you do with Windows, where you go to a page and you download it. Um, I want to use the Waterfox browser. Um, can, it's not adjusting. Uh, there you go. Anyway, uh, yeah, you just click download. So that gave me a file. It, it's the same process you're going to get in Windows. It downloads a file. It's just a .tar file instead of a .zip. When it's Linux, you got that tar format that they have. Uh, it's the same. You will find your way around this much the same way. Um, it ends up in the downloads folder. You can right click it. You can open an archive. You can extract here, extract to. You can open it and see if it's got a folder already for you. So you can just go extract here, you know, the whole thing. And what I decided was I'll just make a folder in my home folder called apps. And any download programs that I just download and run as is that don't have an installer, I just throw in here and there's Waterfox and then I just make a shortcut. Now, the file you run for running the program, there's no exe file. I'll be honest, I haven't bothered to learn yet, um, haven't needed to, exactly how you tell which programs the file to run, but I just figured Waterfox and I double clicked that and sure enough, it opened up. So, all that was left to do was to replace the Firefox um, icon with Waterfox. Um, so all you did, all I did was uh, right click. You can drag other icons into this little panel, obviously. Uh, I can go properties, and it used to have Firefox here. Um, all I did was, where was I? Oh look, so you have this sort of uh, similar to Windows where you can click the folder names to go in and stuff like that but to get the actual path you click this edit icon and you can copy that as a path just like you would in Windows um, going back to my little icon properties I just pasted that path in there and just like in Windows I added the name of the executable file in the end which is Waterfox no extension because that's what was there and sure enough that just worked and it's still got like a Firefox description and a I can change that and the brow and you click the icon, you can change the icon. I just downloaded the Waterfox icon. I made a folder in pictures called icons and I just put it there and I just chose that from there and just and have a Waterfox icon. So that was pretty easy. I won't, it's so straightforward. If you're using Windows, you're used to doing stuff like that. Um, I know sometimes programs have their own icon, you don't have to manually set the icon. Um, but the equivalent of that is the start menu. So the start menu, take the phone off the mount again. Yeah, just right click the menu, um, edit menu, and it's got its, it's a very neat little interface. You can just go new item, uh, new menu, you, you can work it out. It's very easy to use. 
Uh, for example, there's a graphics pixel art program I use called Asaprite. Still don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, yes, it was in the software manager, but it was an older version. And I bought it on Steam, so I just downloaded Steam on the software manager. By the way, half your library will probably run on Linux in Steam, surprisingly. A lot of the games have Linux versions. You don't have to do boot back into Windows to play your games. Um, and yeah, Asaprite was in there, and I made a shortcut to the desktop or whatever the Linux equivalent is for that. And yeah, I just add new item and I put the path that the shortcut had in there. Um, I think it even set the icon correctly, but... Um, oh no, I think I downloaded that one too. But anyway, um, you'll work that out. That's pretty straightforward. It's very uh, intuitive. Uh, and lastly, uh, if you can't find, be open-minded, try and try the Linux version of, Linux equivalent, rather, of a program you're used to using and see how you go. Um, if there's like not a direct release, like Dropbox obviously has a straight Linux version and you can just install it through the software manager, but maybe a certain graphics program or whatever, um, there might be a different program for Linux, but kind of does the same thing. So just search for what might be the Linux equivalent for that or what kind of, and just try it out. So you might be impressed because all of them are free too. So that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, failing that, I mean, so you got your three levels there. You got software manager, you got download. And the third level you can try is if you just can't find a good replacement, you can run your Windows app in Linux with pretty good reliability. Um, I've tried so I hear it's like almost like you can probably you can get nearly practically anything any Windows program aside from games um, that can be oh no no I lie yeah I got duck game working under Linux just fine uh, Xbox controllers and all very impressive um, yeah you just go wine w i n e and it's shown up there already. Just install that. There's many tutorials online about how to get your program running using Wine. Uh, it's not an emulator. It's more efficient than that. It's like a translator. It's like virtualization. It, the program runs directly on your CPU, not like emulation where it's a software program pretending to be the hardware. It does run, get interpreted by your CPU, but it goes through a translation piece of software, which is this wine it's it's called virtualization it still runs just as fast like mer very minimal overhead um there's tutorials on how to set up and then it's just you wouldn't know you're running something that's not meant to run on linux you just get it set up and then you click an icon and the program opens and you're running your favorite program whatever it is um and there's plenty of tutorials about how to use wine so there we are i got as far as i did last time and i shaved off about two minutes um, hopefully that's been useful um, and let me know if you have any questions have fun